The next, no, puedo hacerlo desde aquí. Vale. The next speaker is Leonard Vandenberg. I have also a good relationship with Leonard. Leonard is the director of the ELS unit in Utrecht and is the founder of the Tricals and the founder of the Project Mine. And is the co-chair with Orla of the ENCAS, the European Network for the Cure of ALS. Thank you, Leonard, for coming. And your talk is about the road of to more effective treatment for ALS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for a nice introduction. Thank you, Ola, also for the nice introduction to my uh, talk. I changed the title a little bit because there were some similarities with Ola's uh, title. So I'm going to talk more about, the, uh, about genetics, uh, how we can use genetics to find a treatment for, for this disease, this devastating disease, because that, all the research, what we do is to, uh, to find a treatment. And, and about the genetic architecture and the biology of the disease, Here's some pictures of Utrecht, which is also nice, but by far not as nice as Salamanca. So thank you for the invitation to come here. When I arrived uh, by train uh, last night, um, uh, I um, walked around, enjoyed the city, but then I saw this uh, picture all over the place. And um, I don't know what, if it was a dream or a nightmare, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, we're a little bit competitive. I mean, we're researchers, so I, I walked around the whole night looking for my uh, picture, but, um, okay, I get the message. I just have to work a little harder, and maybe someday my name will be on the streets of Salamanca as well. Um, so these are my disclosures. So what, what uh, well, I already talked about it. Um, for ALS, we need, we need targets, and genetics may be a good way to find these targets. And, and this is uh, an awful cartoon, in it, but it's in many review papers. And it, it actually means that we don't know yet what the cause of the disease is, but there are ma many candidates. I mean, motor neurons are very large neurons, so axonal transport could play uh, a role, or, or mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, oxidative stress could play a role. Um, neuroinflammation, we have genes already uh, that we can uh, uh, target, and we have the glutamate, glutamate excitotoxicity. Uh, the only treatment that we have now for ALS in Europe is really so, it's a glutamate release inhibitor, so it's indirect evidence that glutamate excitotoxicity plays a role in, in uh, ALS. The other phase three trials that are ongoing, and, and Adaveron is already approved in the, in the US, is, is, is on oxidative stress. Uh, we're doing now a, a phase three study in Europe with a nice Spanish company, Ferrer. Um, hopefully, um, uh, we'll be able to find evidence that, that Adaveron is an effective uh, treatment uh, for our patients and will be approved by the EMA. Uh, another trial that we're doing is a combination treatment by, by a, a company uh, called Amelix. Uh, the, the drug has been also approved in, in Canada now uh, last uh, week. It's, it's, it's an interesting drug. It's a combination of two, two drugs targeting mitochondrial dysfunction as well as ER uh, stress. So that may also be a, a strategy for, for the future. Now, of course, we have the gene uh, therapies uh, that are coming and other uh, phase three studies are, are well, ongoing or, or coming. Um, we need uh, more targets because all those treatments uh, are disease-modifying treatments and we need to stop the disease or even hopefully improve um, uh, muscle strength or other features of, of the dis disease. The targets that we have come from uh, familiar, as we know now, about 70% of the familiar cases. We know, we know the genes, over 30 genes have been identified, but four major genes uh, Orla already mentioned. We know there's uh, the heritability of ALS, about, about 40 to 50%. Uh, the other 50% could come from, uh, from lifestyle and environment or some, or, or most of the system could play also a, a role in, in, uh, in the disease. Um, so uh, just a summary of the, the studies that we, that we have done. Most of the work is done by, by Jan Veldink, our neurogenicist in, in our group, and, and Wouter van Rijn. Before 2009, it sounds long ago, but it's not so long ago, we were all working by ourselves. Um, trying to find the gene for, for ALS, we all had our favorite genes, and we're putting all those uh, results, I don't know if you remember, maybe some of you may remember in Excel uh, sheets, uh, very nice, uh, but now uh, we're working on, uh, well, even computers can handle the, the data that we have now, uh, we have to go to large uh, data centers outside of the hospital to store our, and analyze all our genetic results, so I think 
after 2009, collaboration uh, started uh, all over the world on genetics, uh, uh, genetic research. I think that that helped a lot, not only for genetic research, but also for collaboration in, in other uh, fields. Uh, so I, I think genetics is, in that sense, more or less um, um, an example of, of how to move things forward in a relatively uh, rare disease. So now we're reaching uh, a GWAS of over 30,000 and whole genome sequenced data of over 10,000 uh, patients. Uh, and I will talk about that in the coming uh, slides. And the, in, in 2021, we hope to reach the, the 15,000 whole genome sequenced uh, uh, genomes of ALS patients. And why is that important? It's because uh, the, the, yeah, the antisense uh, oligonucleotide uh, therapy that is coming, and uh, well, the greatest example in, in my field, neuromuscular disease, is the SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, more or less like ALS in kids, and uh, uh, that leads to uh, uh, improvement of motor function in these uh, kids, and hopefully could stop the disease. So, so that's exciting in 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 a, in a field that we're working on in, in neurodegenerative disease, and also in progressive um, neuromuscular disease. Uh, this is a re exciting result that we presented at ANCALS, it's our European uh, uh, ALS meeting in, in, in Edinburgh uh, last uh, June, and this is an, 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 a study uh, of antisense therapy uh, in, in SOD1, and uh, it's a phase uh, three study after exciting uh, phase two results, and uh, what it shows is that if you select patients that, that have an early start of the person, then, and also use neurofilament as, as an, uh, um, uh, to, to analyze uh, the, the state of the disease, um, then you see that, that after about six months, the progressive phase stops and there seems to be a stabilization of the disease. And, and I don't know, you probably all know that ALS has a linear progressive disease, so this is quite uh, exciting. Uh, and this is the first example of, of uh, hopefully um, uh, an effective therapy in ALS based on, on genes. And uh, what it also shows is that neurofilament is a good biomarker for that uh, because that, that goes down with the clinical improvement. A nice uh, study um, that, that's ongoing and will be ongoing for the, for the next five years, uh, also by um, uh, Biogen, is, is a, a natural history study and so patients will be followed up and neurofilament will be measured every four weeks. And if the patient becomes symptomatic, we'll go directly in an open label uh, phase, treatment phase. Uh, if the patient, uh, the, the neurofilament increases, so there's no clinical involvement uh, yet, uh, if that increases, the, the, the study goes into a Part B a study, and that's a placebo-controlled study. Patients are getting either the treatment or placebo, and follow-up will be done if patients become symptomatic. They will have the treatment in an, in an open-label study, and the primary outcome for the, the follow up so it's all in pre-symptomatic, uh, I probably should have said that, it's all in pre-symptomatic uh, uh, carriers of the SOD1 uh, gene, and the primary outcome is the percent of patients um, that, that have uh, clinical manifest ALS within 12 months. So hopefully we uh, can prevent uh, pathogenic gene carriers before the disease uh, starts in the future. And these kind of studies I think are very brave to do as a company because it takes five years, uh, uh, but I think that, that will be um, very important for the future. So we need uh, uh, targets, we need, uh, and, and, and genetics helps uh, because, um, well, if you don't know, I mean, in multiple sclerosis, you know the immune system is involved, and uh, in cerebral vascular disease, you know what the cause of the disease uh, is. But in ALS, we, we do not, you know, so, so identifying um, uh, genes that either cause the disease or, or increase the risk of disease will help uh, to, uh, to see what, what pathways are involved in disease and how we can uh, develop a treatment. This is just a spectrum of genetic variants. You have the, the very uh, rare variants uh, that have a very high effect size. Those are the familial cases of disease, the Mendelian disease. And then there are the common variants. Those are the SNPs you identify in, uh, in GWAS. They're very common and they have a very low effect uh, leading to the disease. 
And in the middle is, are the, are the low frequency variants with intermediate, intermediate effect. And, and, and what I will show in a minute is that those variants could, could play a larger role than we think in, in a disease like, uh, like ALS. So, um, so there's actually, well, more or less the same uh, figure, but a little bit nicer colors. Um, so uh, the blue is, 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 the, is, the rare, is the common variance. Uh, and the disease is very rare. And if you go down, uh, the the, um, the variants become more rare, and um, and the disease is more common in um, in f in families. Uh, and all the way down are the uh, very rare variants in in familial cases. So this is the more classic view of ALS, 10 to 50 percent is familial, autosomal dominant inheritance, and then the rest, the sporadic case, we think, is, is, or is, is the complex disease. And um, to um, study that, whether that's actually true, we did, did large genome-wide association studies, the first one in 2009. And we identified uh, two loci. Uh, uh, it was a study in uh, almost 5,000 ALS patients and I think about 10,000 uh, controls. We thought we would find the, cure, the, the, the cause of the disease, uh, the disease. Uh, but two variants turned out to be very important uh, variants, one in, in chromosome 9 and one in uh, 13A. Um, and so first about the locus on, on the, or the SNP on, on the chromosome 9 uh, uh, chromosome is actually multiple uh, SNPs. But um, here on the right side you see it was actually a locus on the gene that was already identified in just classical uh, linkage studies in, in families. And um, the blue bars here represent different linkage studies and, and, and the, the, the region of the, the, um, of, of the, of the gene uh, that was identified as possible where, where, the, where the mutation could, could be. And the green part is actually where we narrowed down, pinpointed the uh, locus towards that area of, of the, of the uh, on chromosome 9. So we sequenced uh, that whole um, uh, part of the gene and no uh, mutations uh, were found. And, and two years later, um, the uh, um, uh, repeat expansion was found in, in, the, in the gene identified by, by three uh, different uh, groups with diff different uh, papers. The CNR North 1972 uh, gene, uh, the most common genetic variant that we know now, causing ALS, uh, about 60% of our families and more than 5% of our sporadic uh, cases. So it's, it's an important uh, gene. And, um, it, it also it was important uh, because it identified more or less or it confirmed what Orla already knew for a long time, but, but not everyone believed yet, is that there's actually an ALS FTD uh, spectrum that's all very closely related, and the CNR Norf gene is, is also present in FTD uh, 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 or is mutated in FTD as well as in ALS, as well as in patients who have ALS and FTD. Is actually what, a, what, a, what the consequence, consequence could, could be. It's a bit indirect evidence, but the ALS publications over the last three years increased by, by 100%. Uh, but the, the ALS publications, this is all from PubMed, uh, on ALS and coordination increased by uh, 400%. I think that's why Orla's picture is all over in the city. And, um, so we also, yeah, there was also a, um, a study presented at NCALS. Uh, showing the results of phase one study uh, of an antisense therapy for the uh, C9 ORF gene were excited whether, uh, because the C9 ORF, the SD1 studies looked uh, so good. So this is a little bit more uh, disappointing, I I'll tell you. Uh, you may already know uh, the result. Uh, I don't have much time to go over it, but it is an antisense oly oligonucleotide uh, targeting uh, gain of function, not loss of function of, of this uh, gene. And um, uh, it's actually uh, this area, and um, it has a nice biomarker for target engagement for the dipeptide repeat protein so you can measure in, uh, in blood, in CSF. And what it shows is that there's a, a clear decline of the uh, biomarkers showing target engagement in the, in, the, in the patients that were treated compared to the green uh, line that is the uh, placebo uh, group. So, so it looked that it, that it could uh, work, but over time, uh, neurofilament went up, 
Um, so it, 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 it should have gone down, but it, it was going up. And that was quite consistent with all the uh, outcome measures that were also measured. Um, they were not all significant, but there was a clear trend that the uh, uh, treatment group did worse than the placebo group. So that um, program by Biogen, uh, unfortunately, uh, was uh, stopped. There could be several reasons. Uh, the, 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 it could be more, it was a more sense uh, approach, but it could be any sense. The, it could be more loss of function instead of gain of function. The gene, uh, maybe the uh, expansion um, or, the, or the, the, the drug or the, the treatment did not uh, target downstream, downstream disease propagation of, 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 of C9 or uh, or there's some un un unknown pathogenic mechanism uh, or um, uh, antisense-related uh, effects. So disappointment, but there are many programs still ongoing uh, to target uh, this gene. So hopefully in the future uh, it will be um, uh, treated, will be a good tra target for treatment um, with a large effect, hopefully, hopefully the same as, as in SOD1, that we can stop the disease. It's, of course, much more common than SOD1-related ALS. So uh, that, that our hopes are on that. What about uh, INC 13A, the other locus that we identified in 2009? We did a, a meta-analysis with a, a genome-wide dissociation study in frontotemporal dementia and found that, that the SNP, SNPs, uh, the INC 13A SNPs, also played a role in FTD. And we also found that INC 13A is a modifier of survival, that uh, patients with INC 13A risk genotype had a much, much faster disease progression than uh, patients um, uh, who did not carry that uh, risk genotype. Well, of course, that's interesting because that's why part of the answer to treatment uh, lies in genes that also modify disease uh, progression. Um, we reanalyzed uh, three large uh, studies on lithium that were already done at that time in the UK, in the Netherlands, and, and Italy. And it was all consistent in these three uh, studies uh, that um, carriers um, in the control group, um, that's actually, uh, so this is a couple of miles, prob probability of survival, and on the x axis, survival time. And um, you can see that the, the INC 13A carriers that were in placebo group had a fast, uh, much faster disease pro progression than the others. And here are three, three lines, uh, two lines with uh, 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 non-carriers, but also the um, uh, carrier, the INC 13A risk genotype carrier that were treated with lithium had, this, had a much better uh, um, uh, outcome of survival. Uh, than the carriers uh, in the control group. So now we're doing a phase uh, three uh, study, a prospective study to see whether we, whether we can confirm this. So we are doing a placebo controlled study with lithium in patients with carrying the INC13A uh, genotype. This is other um, this is a kind of uh, um, nice uh, preclinical studies published in Nature uh, this uh, year, linking uh, TDP43 uh, loss and the INC13A uh, gene. TDP43 was repressed by cryptic exon inclusion in the FTD uh, gene, and um, it could be uh, the reason. Um, uh, so so the, it links the TDP43. TDP43 deletion from the nucleus in the cells to INC13A, which is a synaptic uh, a protein or a gene that encodes a, a synaptic protein. And um, so that, that identifies INC13A also as a, as a, as a target uh, for, for treatment. So further, we uh, did another study in, in 2016, uh, a larger study, doubled the study, more than, more than doubled the study in 12,500 uh, studies. This is a study published in Nature Genetics by uh, Wouter von Rehn and, and, and supervised by uh, Jan Velding. Uh, we identified uh, seven, uh, uh, excuse me, six uh, loci, including the two loci already uh, identified. Um, so, so not as much probably as we expected in other diseases like schizophrenia. Uh, much more um, hits were identified at, at, at studies that, that uh, size. What is important, I think, also from that study is that we uh, also looked at the uh, architecture of the genetic architecture of the, of the disease. 
And uh, we found that actually the contribution of the, of the genome-wide significant SNPs uh, to heritability of the disease was very small, and only 0.2% uh, uh, of the, uh, could only explain 0.2% of the heritability of, of the uh, disease. So there are many more um, uh, targets and many more genetic variants that, that play a role in, in the disease. Uh, we looked, uh, we found a, a significant correlation between heritability and chromosome length. This actually shows that, it is, that ALS is a polygenic uh, disease. And uh, we also looked at the, uh, the uh, uh, frequency of the, uh, the allele, uh, minor allele frequency um, um, and uh, the heritability. And we compared that to uh, schizophrenia, to large schizophrenia uh, genome-wide association study in schizophrenia. So the red bars are the results of the schizophrenia um, uh, genome-wide association study, and the blue bars are the uh, ALS. So that, that are the results from, from our study. And uh, what you see here is that the um, um, minor allele frequency or, or the alleles are, are much more rare in, in ALS. Uh, compared to schizophrenia, which is co considered more of a complex uh, uh, disease. So this shows that rare variants, so even more rare variants that we can identify in these genome-wide association studies may play a role in, in the disease. And that was also from the low side that we found in this genome-wide association study, we could uh, see rare variants in those low side identified. This is just an example of the C21ORF2 uh, gene, and the same was actually also true. That was also published in another paper, the KIF5A uh, gene. So, if, if you want to identify rare variants, you have to do larger studies, but the whole genome sequencing could be important. And we started a large genome-wide, uh, a, a large whole genome sequencing uh, project. Uh, it was actually started by, by uh, two, by three patients. One visited our lab. Maybe this may help. If you ever have a rich businessman visiting your lab, never do the introduction yourself, but take the youngest PhD student to show, the, show him or her around the lab. And he, he was actually showing um, the fridge with 10,000 uh, samples. And this businessman asked, uh, what are you doing with those samples? And he gave the per perfect answer. He said, nothing. So this person donated a lot of money to do whole genome sequencing of our uh, cases. And uh, because, of course, he couldn't uh, deal with the fact that we're doing nothing. Um, so it, it actually turned out a nice global uh, uh, project, uh, Project Mind, make it uh, yours. It's more a, a human genome project of, of ALS and we want to identify all genetic variants that could play a role in disease. Um, uh, so um, 50, we want to hold genome sequence, uh, 15,000 ALS patients in 7,500 controls that could also be used for other diseases. And we also want to start the, the largest possible GWAS, so uh, collect a large, uh, even larger um, set of DNA uh, samples. It was a crowdfunded uh, event, and uh, so lots of, of, of activities went on in the Netherlands, but also all over the world. The um, uh, Ice Bucket Challenge helped us also in this uh, project. As you can see, that was actually me. I'm sure you did not recognize me. Um, we also did swimming, uh, a swimming event in, in Amsterdam, City Swim, the Amsterdam City Swim. It was um, uh, also good for the city council because they just cleaned the water, the canals, uh, the smelly water. All bikes, all dead bodies were in the, in the water, but they, they cleaned it up and we went swimming for, for ALS. And it was very successful and it raised awareness, especially for, because this person and I'm just showing this because, uh, but uh, Queen Sophia is not here anymore, but hopefully she listens, or you have time to tell her tonight, um, that this person who was swimming in the canals, six months later, she became our queen of the Netherlands. 
So I always say, if, we, if, if our students don't believe you find a treatment for ALS, I say, look what happens. You swim in the canals, and then six months later, you're a queen. So we'll, we, we are able to find a treatment for, for ALS. And uh, so maybe uh, Queen Sophia, uh, she already helped a lot by being here. It raises awareness. It's very important that people like her help us finding a cure for disease. We can't do it on our own. We need uh, people like her to, to help. So I hear with, uh, oh, there's, there's uh, there, there, She's hearing me, I'm afraid. Um, um, so I hereby invite her, maybe in August 28, we have the next uh, Amsterdam City Swim. So hopefully she or some other person from her family is able to uh, join us. I am um, uh, actually happy that she's not here because I made this picture. Uh, <laughs> took me a long uh, time, but I, I, I think it looks very good on her. Uh, yeah. So let's hope um, she will go swim for ALS too. We have a nice uh, website. And on the website, if you're interested in, in, in our data, because we have a large set of data, also genome association, you can look at it on the website. You go to research, you see all the data that's available, also maybe for your project, uh, but also the, the um, um, uh, these are all the, all the organizations that helped us. These are all the countries, so it's a nice system. It's more of a franchise system, so for each country you, you had to have a researcher, an ALS foundation, and then it would be Project Mine Spain, Project Mine Portugal, Project Mine uh, US. And um, so many people were involved, uh, so everyone is in charge of his own data, but we all share it. These are the, all the countries involved. Spain, 570 genomes, so that was actually a large contribution to this uh, project. Many papers used the data from Project uh, MINE, uh, many research groups, and this is a public data by browser that's also on the website. You can just enter your favorite gene, and then all kinds of data, what comes out of the uh, whole genome sequencing uh, is uh, on this, uh, it will be on the on the screen, and it will be data free soon. It will be updated very soon to even more uh, genomes. There are working groups, and uh, they will play the well. It all continued during uh, COVID. This is a, just a, a difficult slide, but it shows the the, the governance. And it's all very simple. We have general assembly. There's all the people who contributed to the data. Each uh, uh, person that contributed data, the data is still they still own the data. So if there's a project, um, you can just say whether you want to be part of it or not. Uh, but I think the message is: if you have a project, just uh, uh, tell us, and we can uh, you, you can be a project of Project Mind without being part of Project Mind. Um, that's the basis of this consortium. And also based on this, we also started TriCals, a, tr a trial consortium. Orla already talked uh, about, and um, Monica is, uh, has contributed a lot and is part of that uh, too, uh, uh, to find better treatment. Uh, we have a good consortium of good trial centers in, in Europe, not only to do trials, but also improve uh, clinical studies and clinical trial design. So the last part is the, the latest uh, genome-wide association study we did in, th in over 30,000 uh, patients and in 8,000 patients that were whole genome uh, sequenced. We identified 15 loci, I won't go all over it, but many had, had also rare uh, variants. And what's interesting from this study, what we did is we also uh, looked at other genome-wide association studies in other neurodegenerative diseases, not only in other neurodegenerative diseases, but also in, in diseases like cerebrovascular disease or multiple sclerosis. But it turns out there, there are good correlations with other neurodegenerative diseases, but not with those other diseases. And here you can see, so Alzheimer's disease, um, SPD, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, PSP, and FTD, that there is actually uh, quite some genetic overlap between the genome-wide association with the gene genetic, genetic contributions in the disease uh, with, with, uh, with ALS. And that actually, if you all put that together in one big study, it also helps to identify a new loci. Um, there are two, actually, in this, this, there are two new loci um, so here are all the studies in, in ALS and all the other neurodegenerative diseases, and these are the sizes of the studies. And here you can see that there's actually this gene 
our genetic variant uh, plays a role in all these four diseases and uh, some only in uh, two. So there's quite some overlap within neurodegenerative disease, so that's a good reason to collaborate, I think, better between the uh, groups working on different neurodegenerative diseases. We also looked at um, enrichment in uh, tissue using a large uh, gene expression uh, data sets. And in ALS, we found that the, enrich that the enrichment is, is in brain uh, tissue um, and um, also in many regions of, of the brain. Um, and if you compare that to Parkinson's disease, it's similar. Uh, but for example, Alzheimer's disease, there's more overlap in tissue with blood, lung, and spleen. So more in uh, with, with tissue that's involved in the immune system, and not so much in the neuron and the brain regions as as ALS and and Parkinson's disease. If you look more specific at what kind of uh, cells, then you see that for uh, ALS, it's it's neurons, but it, interestingly, it's also glutamergic uh, neurons, and we know that uh, I started with Rilizol, that is an effective drug for for ALS. So that actually uh, confirms uh, that. And um, uh, for um, Alzheimer's disease, microglia play are more uh, enriched. Uh, so um, that also uh, fits in, in the uh, previous slide where um, uh, with immune cells, tissue. We also did a pathway uh, analysis with co um, uh, co-expression uh, data in, in brain uh, uh, tissue, and we found uh, that the um, uh, network um, uh, on autophagy uh, was enriched, so that, that may play a role in, in ALS. Um, so to end, so my time is up, is it, Monica? No, I know. Uh, that's what I was saying. I know myself. <laughs> One more slide. Okay, two. two. <laughs> so, um, so this is a summary: neuron-specific biology and autophagy uh, play, may play a central role in ALS. But if we look at the uh, genes, and I said this also before, is if we look at the susceptibility uh, low side that we have found, only very few also play a role in disease uh, progression. So, if we phenotype, we look at the uh, survival, uh, only seen. seen uh, C9 ORF and UNC 13A, we knew that already, um, and some SOD1 related targets um, have, play a role in disease progression, but the others don't. So um, it could be that we have to uh, look better at uh, disease progression um, in our genome wide data sets in Project MINE. So we have to phenotype better uh, of, um, of the, the patients that we have in our database, and that's not so easy because it's done in many countries, and hopefully, hopefully Precision ALS, uh, that started by Orla, may play a role in, uh, in that. Um, so that, that may be important to identify a treatment. Now we have 14,000 patients that are genotyped, and that we also have the data on the disease progression. And we have to look at families, probably geno uh, phenotype our families better, uh, to look for a rare variant, so we may not have to increase the size, but look more direct in our in our in our uh, pedigrees that we have. Try to link uh, families uh, to each other, and uh, also look at the phenotype better. Maybe there are alternative phenotypes like uh, psychosis, schizophrenia, uh, that that Orla did a little work uh, on, and also FTD and, and ALS. So that is also work for the future. And hopefully we can we can start um, family-based or pedigree-based uh, antisense or oligonucleotide uh, therapy um, uh, on a large scale in on our population with uh, with ALS. Okay, this is it. This is actually the, the trichaos. I don't have time to talk about, but uh, maybe the next speaker. <laughs> it's a nice. Uh, um, I think initiative like Project Mine, but now based on better trials. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Leonard. And Orla, we don't have time for questions. Perhaps after the last speaker, uh, 